Okay, we've kind of got it rough shaped on the ends. It could be refined a little bit more. I'm not too worried about that yet because we've still got lots of detail to put in this and we can always refine it a little bit more. So we're, we're in pretty good shape for the shape we're in. And uh, we're going to now round this off. Now, there's a lot of ways you could do this. And, and probably the easiest way would be to take it over to the sander and just round it off, okay? And we may end up doing that, but that what's the fun in that? We need to show Kim the technique of using the finger plane. And the finger plane is so helpful so often. And often I just do the whole thing with the finger plane because it's just it just works so good, you know? And, but you do need to learn the technique of using the finger plane. And, you know, the finger plane will allow you to sculpt it versus uh, the sander will only allow you to just, you know, roll it over or whatever. Um, and that may be all we need to do in this case, but I'm just pointing out that uh, learning the finger plane skill is a very handy luthier skill. So you can see what I'm doing here. I'm grabbing it like that and I'm just rolling it around there and you can see it's almost effortless. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. won't be when you try it. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, over the top here, and then you would, of course, do the same thing over here. Mm -hmm. Like that. I'll let you do some of that. You can feel yeah. the difference cutting that way because you're cutting at a 45 now. Sure. But I, I think the difference there with the finger plane is it, it's, it's more tactile. You can really tell that you're shaping it to the shape you want versus with a sander, you can't you put it on there and you take it off and you go, oh, did I get what I wanted? You know? Yeah, yeah. Where this, you can pretty much tell you're getting what you want the whole time. Now, you could also use a Dremel uh, sanding wheel or a sanding drum, and, and you can kind of do it the same way you're doing the, this, but but it's really a nice feel to use those finger planes and, and sure. watch them do their magic. Yeah. Potentially, maybe a little bit on the front to do the same kind of thing, a little bit, but not as much, yeah. but a little bit here and a little bit there. You can hear that chatter sound. Yeah. That means you're kind of going across that Cross. end grain. So if you can find a different direction to go, you'll be better off. Because that chatter yeah. will actually show up in your finish there. I mean, of course, you will sand it anyway. But, I mean, my point is it won't be as smooth. I'm, I'm just going to, just to accent a little bit of a curl, yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to do a little bit more here. Just yeah. because it just makes it look nice, I think. Like this would be, I could do this with the sander again, but I can just do it right here too, you know, because we want to come out to this point basically. So we kind of get to our point there, and then the same way here, we want this to kind of come back to our point. You understand my point there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the only other thing is this front edge is a little bit sharp. I don't know how this one is, but typically I, I typically round them off just a little bit. Yeah. No point in having anything sharp there where your hand can kind of hit it. And then even the edges, but we can get those with a file probably better. And you can you can put less pressure on this and cut even less. And you know, it, there's all kinds of uh, techniques with using these things on uh, that you just learn over time. Like I'm barely skimming the surface now. I'm not even hardly touching it, uh, and yet it's still cutting, but it's just barely taking anything off. Wood is growing a different way. It does not want to be cut that way. I can tell. Anyway, that gets you pretty close, and, and really just by looking at it like that, you go, well, that's not too bad. It's rough. You can tell it's rough and it needs some sanding, but it's really not too bad. Uh, maybe here could come a little bit more. And then the other thing you can do is you can always measure it uh, a little bit, you know, just to kind of go, well, am I really about the right length here? Of course, it helps if you use the right end of the ruler. That's about three centimeters, roughly, um, and about three centimeters there. We're really pretty close, I mean, just by eye, you know. And then to that corner, um, this one's going up to the corner a little better than this one is, yeah. so yeah. maybe just bring this up to the corner a little bit more. You, you can monkey with this stuff all day long. And the, the last thing to do is to look at this one and go, was there anything else carved into it? Like, what, did they carve it more on the, sh on the treble than the bass? And it looks fairly symmetrical. So I don't really see any reason to, to do anything extra. No, I think I would just, I think we're probably fine, really. Um, we, we could potentially run it back into the sander again, but I don't really think we need to. And now I think we just can sand it. I think we're, we'll be fine. Because again, it's all by eye, and this is 99% cosmetic is really what it amounts to. So now we're putting the elbow grease to it. Ever since the days of old, man has searched for wealth untold. They dig for silver, pan for gold, and leave the empty hole. Sanding is the less glamorous part of luthery, but it's a very necessary skill to learn. And, and using the right sandpaper makes all the difference. This type of sandpaper that I've gotten used to using is so much better and so much far superior than any other sandpaper I've ever used. It's, it's called uh, 3M Advanced Abrasive uh, No Slip Grip. 
lasts longer, it says, and uh, it certainly does. It's a much better uh, sandpaper than anything I've ever used in the past. I think that's the thing that's different about instruments than furniture. People don't get down and uh, scrutinize furniture too much in terms of getting down and looking at every little minor detail, but on instruments, they do. They look at everything. And so if there's the least little problem or flaw, it catches your eye. The edges are much easier sanded now than they would be if, if you had it on the instrument. So I'm just going to go ahead, even though we've sanded the edges with the machine, it's nice to just very lightly touch them up with this sandpaper too. Um, you don't see them too much, but you will see them. You don't need to do a whole lot, just enough to dress them up a little bit. So, for my money, that looks at least as good as what was there, so I think we're good. I see one little flaw right in here, and I think it's a mark of a maybe where I was planing these ends here. This end grain, because basically you're sanding end grain when you're going up that hill. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always difficult to sand and get perfectly smooth, so I'm just going to rub it a little bit more. Well, it's not perfect, but it's close enough for me. If it was perfect, it wouldn't look like I had anything to do with it. Now, the next trick is, how do you transfer these holes? And, you know, in one way, it would probably would have been smart to transfer them before we rounded this all off. And that's really true. It, it probably should have been done. Uh, and we probably should have just went ahead and, and drilled them. But then it's a lot harder to carve it, too, because of all the holes. But, but either way, we, we could have done it either way. And uh, we did it this way, so this is what we're, we're going to deal with. And now we'll just need to uh, transfer those holes. And, and for that, I typically just use the very fine pencil lead. Now, I've got transfer punches. You know, if everything were perfectly flat and, and you could clamp this, I would use transfer punches. But in this particular case, because we're dealing with it the way we have chose to do it in our order of operations, this is probably just as good or better, maybe even better, than a transfer punch, because the transfer punch isn't going to sit flat on those curved edges now. Make a bigger circle than others, and I don't know exactly why, but I can look down through there and tell that some of them have a bigger circle. But the main thing is you get your bit in the center of the circle. Looks pretty good. Now we have those marked, and we'll take it over to the drill press, and we'll drill these holes out. Down south in the Everglades, where the black waters roll and the salt grass sways, the eagles fly and the otters play in the land of the Seminole. Okay, well that worked out pretty doggone well. So far, Kim's used a bandsaw, the sander, and the drill press, and he still has all of his digits. Amazing, amazing. Now this is the trickiest part of it so far. It's not the trickiest part of the whole operation, but it's definitely the trickiest part so far. And that is you take a uh, X-Acto knife and you score this very lightly all the way around here. And why do I say that's tricky? Because it's not too hard. There's two tr problems with it. Number one, as you get to a corner like this, sometimes you'll be pulling and you'll jerk past it. For some reason, it just happens. I don't know why that happens, but it does, especially when you get to these short corners and things. So you got to be careful of that, that you stop where you need to stop. But the bigger problem is that if, if you turn this just the slightest little bit of a crook to this, just either way like that, it'll cause this to pull out and you can pull right out away from your uh, bridge and, and cut out into your top. Ask me how I know that. So you want to keep this uh, knife angled at your bridge the whole time so that you're cutting toward your bridge, not away from it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to sharpen this up just a little bit because um, it's they're actually better to use them when they don't have their real needle tip on them, but, but you do want them perfectly sharp. So I'm going to sharpen that off camera just with a whetstone a little bit and then we'll be right back. Okay, so Kim's going to get brave here and Try to trace that outline. You want enough pressure to go through the finish, but not to cut too deep into the top. And yeah, two or three times over, it depends on the amount of pressure you're using. 
until and I got close to the thing there. You might get a little too <laughs> close and then you're cutting wood, so you don't want to do that either if you can help it. Blow, 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 wind, blow like you're never gonna blow again. I'm calling to you like a long lost friend, but I know who you are. And blow, blow from the Okeechobee all the way up to Mekinope. All right, and then we can take this off and we should see it there. Um, you know, quite honestly, it probably wasn't quite hard enough, um, but not too bad. It was all right, I think. The test of it is to see how it breaks up, like yeah. right here, to see if this if it breaks on that score line. It doesn't. Well, yeah, maybe it will. It's. I don't think it's scored quite deep yeah, enough. Yeah. I think I would score it some deeper, and it's probably safest to score it with this back in place. And all the pins line up perfectly, so that's not too hard to do. I'm going to go ahead and score over that, and I'm going to put a little bit more pressure on it this time. I'm not actually feeling the wood under there yet, and usually when you go this way, you'll feel the wood. You'll feel the fibers start to bounce. I think I'm starting to feel it there. Okay, I think we might be good enough. Let's see if this will chip off now. Yeah, it looks like it's chipping off now. And it should chip off and make a perfectly straight line. Hey, Kim, I'm going to let you do that. Now, what the trick of this is, is you want to keep a close eye on it. And if you see it lifting past that line, if you see the, even the slightest movement, you stop. Yep. So and then and then the other thing is we're going to want to get all this glue off of here too, yeah. and you can see here that that glue has actually held it up from the top. You know, uh, it it really never made contact with it. You know what I mean? And so this will make it sound better by getting all this out of there and making getting everything flush to the to the top. The reason I use this, by the way, for everyone who is asking why I'm not using a chisel, chisels are square and they, they gouge on the corners really bad. This has got a round end and you can rock this like this and really do a fine detail job with this without tearing out anything. I would say your technique should be to rock it as much as you can uh, so, rather than just pushing. Okay. In other More words, like, you like know. yeah, just, yeah, like that. And then, and then uh, that way you won't make a mistake and go too far. Yeah. That that rocking action will pop it up. You know what I mean? Right. Oops. Oops. <laughs> see how oh, that can lucky. happen? <laughs> see, got lucky. You did. You got lucky. And see yeah. how fast it can happen. Now yeah. you. Now you. Now you know. That's never happened to me. <laughs> never. Well, you got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where I got lucky. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's quite a bit of glue build up there, especially because on this narrow end, the the bridge was sitting up high on this finish, and that little narrow end there just filled up with glue, and yeah. so it's really a lot of glue. It may not be the best technique, but it might work good. On this thick thing, I'm going to turn it around this way, and I'm actually going to take the little finger plane and actually come across this. And I know where the blade starts, so I'm starting inside of the mark there. And, and I'm going to see if we can thin that a little bit. Sometimes you can. I'm not saying this is going to work. Um, sometimes if you thin it like that, it chips out so much easier. Eh, it's not really working all that well, but it, it did thin it some. So then I'll let you go back to your technique there. But uh, sometimes when you get it thin, it chips out much easier. Across the home of the Seminole, the alligator and the guard. Progress came and took its toll, and in the name of flood control, they made their plans and they drained the land. Now the glades are going dry. Last time I walked in the swamp, I stood upon a cypress stump. I listened close and I heard the ghost of Osceola cry. Pretty we did pretty good. Uh, this little one, Larry, but we might be okay. Not, and then I think I scored too 
far in on that one. But so, like, this is still. Are we trying to get rid of this sort of glue, or is this something we? That's well, when you get when you get down to the like detail, like that little yeah, spot yeah, right gotta, there, what, go. what I typically do is grab a hold of it and pull it back in. Yeah, uh, you know, like I just grab a hold of that spot like that and yeah. just pull it in. Yeah, and uh, like yeah. that. Yeah, okay, so right just turn it turn it upside down and, and and get it right on there and just pull it in. Yeah. So let me try that. Yeah. See, just for cleaning up that last little bit, and then make sure. Well, put your new bridge in there and yeah. then make sure it fits, you know, right. like take take totally. the pins out of there and make sure that it actually, you can, you can actually you feel it. It sort of drop down. In it there. should dr literally drop in there and you should be able to just kind of feel it drop in there. I think you might be there. You might, you might just, you know, check it out and like maybe that little mark there, just check that mark out and yeah. make sure that it's right. You know, get your light down here and, and, you know, put the whole thing in there where it's supposed to be and then see if that should be cut out you know yeah that kind of thing just look at it real close and and maybe right here on this yeah. corner yeah, see, definitely. that's why it doesn't feel like it's perfectly sitting in there yet yeah yeah and maybe right maybe yeah, just right totally, on that very totally. tiny corner too even so blow blow send the wind blow like you're never gonna blow again i'm calling to you like a long lost friend but i know who you are the home of the Seminole, the alligator and the gar. Well, my friends, uh, Kim did a good job cleaning up this area, and I don't have this position perfectly right at the moment. I just We're just doing kind of a dry fit up to make sure the clamps and things are going to work. And I'll show you what we're doing here. We can't use our typical clamps because they won't fit through the sound hole. Well, look at there, it already failed me right there on camera. Because I turned the camera on, I had a little block glued there and it's already fallen off because I turned the camera on. And so did this one. I tell you, it just never seems to fail. So what I'm doing is I'm CA gluing this on here and I'm putting this little block here. And the reason I'm doing this is because we can't fit a call in there either, partly because of the pickups and things that are in there. So uh, we, we don't want to use a call. We're just using a little block to kind of even out and get behind this brace that's in here. There's an X brace. So we'll see this time, will it stay? You know, like I told you, it always sticks better the second time. Now I got to get those blocks out of there. And here's one of them. Maybe the other one you're just going to own because, no, I got it. <laughs> okay, so let's try this again. I'll put some more CA glue on here and clamp this on here yet again. That should work. Like I said, the second time it usually doesn't turn loose. So we'll call that good. All right, so now uh, what we want to do is we, we've already cleaned this up, and as you can tell, it's pretty clean, pretty flat. As a matter of fact, it's exceptional, really. There was almost no tear out it at all, which is fairly unusual. We've roughed up the backside of this a little bit, um, and when I say roughed up, I don't mean like we gouged it. I just mean we just scratch it just enough to get the glaze off of it. Ebony glazes over when you sand it. It gets just shiny and slick like a mirror. So we just knocked that off a little bit. It'd be the equivalent of taking rough sandpaper and just lightly hitting it, just to, just to make a surface. Now we're ready to go ahead and get the tight bond on here. I think we're gonna use tight bond original wood glue and we'll just spread that around. I would have Kim do this, except there's really not much technique to this. You just make as big a mess as you possibly can make. It all works out in the end. The only technique that I am gonna show here to Kim is that you want to brush this on and, and you could People would say, oh, you could just smear it with, you know, a, a little plastic thing or use your finger. No, take your brush, do this, and work it in. And the reason you do that, you'll be surprised how many air bubbles will stay in here and then you just don't get perfect coverage. By working it in like this, you'll get perfect coverage and you won't have any air bubbles. Trust me, it just makes a difference. Same thing up here. You, you, want, you can take the same glue that you got here and just work it on this. You want both surfaces covered. This is not the place ever to take a shortcut. 
just take your time and uh, make sure everything is 100% covered because you only get one shot at this. Thin coverage is actually better than thick coverage, but 100% coverage is the most important on both. You know, in other words, a lot of squeeze out is not the goal. You, you just want 100% coverage. And by the fact that you get this in there and get it down in that finish, once you get it there, it, the whole instrument is locked in. It doesn't move. And that's the other thing you want to look for. Only, only because we already have holes in this, um, you could do a couple things if you wanted to. You could try to clean those holes out a little bit with uh, get some of that glue out of there. That's not a bad idea. Uh, mainly in this case because we don't want it to stick to whatever we're sticking on the inside there to clamp it up. It just squeezes glue out. And so we're just, wherever I see a big buildup of glue, I'm just reaching in there and getting it out. Probably I'd be better if I just took a second and got a toothpick to do that, which I can't find right now. Still not quite. There we go. I think I think I might be in the hole now. I'm going to put these pins in temporarily, uh, just mostly for alignment, just to make sure that the alignment is still perfect. I think it is. We're going to take them back out because we don't want to glue them in place. All right. I think we're good there. Now we'll get the first clamp on. This one's a little tricky, as I said, because we got these, these wires in here. So I want to get around the wires and get up to the spot. Um, actually, now that I think about it, I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to take these pins back out right now because I want to go ahead and use this because it does seem like it's going to work. And I'll center it on here. All right, and then we'll go through here with this other one and again I'm trying to make sure those wires aren't in my way and the reason we put that piece of wood on the end of the clamp again it's kinda of to take the place of that call which gets us over that X brace. The X brace is thick that kinda of takes up the space of that X brace keeps the uh, clamp fairly square that way not that that's that important. However you get it clamped, as long as you get 100% clamping pressure on it, you're probably fine. Now we're tightening these down to where they're snug. That's the little wings on the ends. That helps keep the very ends of the bridge down. We're down pretty good with all of that. We're getting pretty decent squeeze out all the way around. There's fairly even squeeze out all the way across there, which is a good thing. It kind of tells you you're getting pretty equal pressure. We don't really have another clamp this size that'll fit in here really well. So what I'm going to do instead is just take these, this wedge right here in the middle and I'm going to push it in right here in the very center like so and uh, I'm going to push one in from the other side too like so and that does the same thing as a clamp except it's probably even better because wedges really do get tight and uh, you can push them in like that if you need to tap them you could tap them if you think you need to do that but in my case I think we're plenty tight by pushing them in there really hard and we're tight here we're tight here again don't worry about squeezing all the glue out you'll never do that no matter what they tell you that'll never happen I think we're better than perfect we'll just clean up our little mess here and then uh, we're going to lunch I don't know about you but we're leaving well, we made it back from our lunch, and we're going to go ahead and take this off. It's, it's been well over an hour, so we should be fine to take this off. Look at there, the one block didn't stay on again. I don't know where it went. Maybe it's stuck on the inside in there. I don't think so. I don't feel it. Maybe it fell down. And there's the wedges. Everything looks pretty good. I can see some glue squeeze out inside there. Let's take a look up inside the, ma the machine here and see what we see on the inside. I don't think we'll see anything unusual, but just, just to make sure. I'm looking to see if that block glued up there. I didn't. So it must have fell out. Maybe that was it right there. Or is that it? So let's see a glue isn't sticking very good for some reason. Let's look at your brace that we glued up earlier and make sure it's still good. I would think it is. So the brace to me looks like it's fine. I don't see any problem. We're at the stage now where we need to set the intonation and cut the slot in here. I do it this way. You, you could have, you know, traced the slot here and cut the slot based on this, but it's more accurate 
to actually uh, determine where the slot should be cut once the bridge is in place and then cut the slot and then you'll know your intonation is perfect so that's what we're going to do got my little rig on here now this rig i had to make special for this uh instrument because i didn't have one that uh, was narrow enough for this and would just work out so we just quickly bent this it's just a piece of metal uh, it's just enough to hold the strings that's all it is and we got some leather there to keep it from making any scratches we just laid a saddle on top of here this saddle is just floating and we move it around to wherever we think we need to move it to get the action just right now our action here is probably a hair high I don't think it's much high though let's double check that just to be sure because sometimes things will fool you Actually, if anything, it's probably low. <laughs> That's funny. See, it's it's only Seven. it's only like around 60 to 65. I don't think it even makes it to 70 before it's hitting. See, it's it's hitting pretty low. So we're we're pretty good on the action here. And it's only like 50 on that side. So so we probably want this tuner to be spot on because uh, we're really spot on on the action. In other words, if, if the action was really high here, then if, we, if, if it was set um, uh, spot on, then when we drop this down, it'll probably be flat, you know, because we're not stretching the string as much. We want to get this as close as possible right now because I think we're just about at the perfect height. I'm checking the tuner here right now. Maybe you can see it. It's pretty close. A little bit high. in there something it's pretty close we're pretty close maybe if anything we're just a fraction of a hair high so I'm just gonna move it back just a fraction of a hair right on the money I think I'd say we're about as close as we're gonna get and I'm gonna make a mark right under that string and right under this string and the reason I'm not drawing all the way across it is because this particular sa or saddle has got a little bit of a bend to it. But it doesn't matter about the rest of it. All that matters is what where this string ends right here and this string ends right here. And we know that's our line and we'll draw that line on here. I'm, I'm convinced that that's good enough. I think it's, it's pretty good. Especially since our action's pretty close. So we should end up with a real good result. So we're going to take the strings off of this and get ready to, to cut this. All right, we've got our two little marks there. Now that's the front edge of the saddle. And I make all my saddles where they work off of the front edge. I don't do the high and the middle saddle type deal. Uh, and the reason I do this is because, you know, quite often things, a, a note will be sharp and you'll have to flatten it. And uh, you can, this will give you plenty of room to flatten the note in within the saddle if you work off that front edge. Plus, more importantly than that, it stops the buzzing. You know, people hear all the time a buzz and they can't figure out where it's coming from. And if you're if your string is sitting high in the middle, it can be buzzing off the front edge of your saddle. Where if, if the highest part of your saddle is the front edge, it cannot buzz off of there. So that's the main reason I actually use the front edge of the saddle. Okay, we had an armrest in our way and we had to amputate. So we took the armrest off and now I can set my little rig on here. Uh, the rig's important in that, um, you know, it. it we need a line here to follow that needs to be parallel to this line. And so we set this up like so, and we can turn it a lot of different ways. We could turn it on any one of those square faces, whatever seems to work out the best. Um, actually, that one's not square. It's got a little bump in it, and so does that. So it'd have to be one of these faces. And we'll have to move this back like so, and get it back in approximately that area there and uh, then we still have some fine adjustment that we can do. We'll clamp it down approximately there and then we'll do the fine adjusting. Okay, so once we get the rig mounted and the rig is mounted, by the way, this one is just floating, the front one. It's just there for elevation. It's not, it doesn't really matter. Then you, then you just take and you follow this with your eye and you watch how closely the bit is following your line. And it's following it pretty close except on this side it uh, needs to come toward the line a little bit. 
And then you just do it. It's just trial and error. Now that because of that, that moved this one a little bit, so we need to move it back just a tiny bit. So it's just trial and error back and forth until you're satisfied. And what I try to do is make sure that the cutting edge of the bit is following the line because there's a, it's a spiral bit and it only cuts on that front edge. And I can see the front edge of the bit is right on my line pretty much. So it just happened to be that way. And that's where you want it. It's absolutely perfect. I don't see it moving at all. I'm just gonna tighten this all down, make sure it's good and snug. As far as I can tell, that's perfect. Now what I want to do is I want to drop that bit down till it touches that highest spot there in the middle of, this, of the bridge. And so we're going to drop it down. It's touching. I'm going to lock it in place. And then I'm going to adjust this to cut a, a certain depth from there. Now that I dropped it, it's bothering me because it looks like it's cutting to the front edge of my line. I want it to cut to the back of my line. So I'm just a pencil line off as far as I can tell and that's a 0.5 millimeter so it's just a half a millimeter off so just that little bit you, you can even make that kind of an adjustment all right um, so now I'm going to adjust this for depth the way I do that is with this little pin here we have a little pin we've inserted, and then I just pick out, oh, something like a, a saddle or something like that that I think is about the right depth of cut. Let's pick one out that I think looks about right. And to me, that looks about right, about the amount of depth I want to cut at one time. And then I just kind of set this in there, drop this down till it touches, like so. Then I tighten that up. So now I've got this bar is set to the thickness of that. Now I can take the saddle out of there. He says, yes I did, I was able to. I got it out of there. Now I can plunge this base up to hit that stick and I'll be cutting exactly the depth of the thickness of that, if that makes sense to you. Hopefully it does. Let me lay this back on here, make sure that, that I'm in line still. We still are in line, so it looks great. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it on and I'm gonna plunge down to the depth of this cut. Now I would ordinarily let um, Kim do this. I think I'd be safer to do the first cut myself and let him do the second cut because I, it's really hard to explain how the, the forces on this. They like to pull you one way or the other. And even I can make a mistake on this, don't get me wrong. Uh, I mean, I've done it a bunch of times, but this is not an easy thing to do. And, you, and it can mess up everything you've done up to this point by screwing this up. So no pressure. One thing I failed to do or forgot to do was to mark how far I want to take it each way. So I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm sure I haven't gone too far. So I'm just going to take it out of here and mark that now. You know, I could have marked that beforehand. That would have been a good thing to do, but I just forgot. And I, how am I going to do that? I'm probably just going to do it by eye. Believe it or not, I'm almost perfect right now, but I'm going to go ahead and, and move it. The longer the saddle, the better, I think. So I'm going to make it a fairly long saddle. I'm just going to mark over here about the same distance from the end. And it, I'm just doing it by eye because that's really all that matters is does it look okay. Now, I will tell you that because of these holes are cut on a slant, it there's more space probably between here and this first hole than there is between here and this first hole. But, you know, it's just the way, it's kind of an optical illusion because of the way those are cut on a slant. I'm more or less going by the width of the bridge and I'm cutting it the full width of the bridge. And that way it'll transfer the sound across the top the best. All right, so now all I gotta do is get this back in here without making a mess and turn it back on and here we go. Well, that went about as good as it can go. 
So we have a nice straight slot there, and uh, it's a nice, uh, you know, fairly wide, thick slot too, so it should handle anything that we want to throw at it. The only thing we need to do now is make it a little deeper. And I'll see if uh, Kim wants to get brave enough to do that. We talked it out, and we think that Kim might want to learn to practice on something else before, besides this finished piece, because this is really hard to do. It, it, it looks fairly simple on video, but honestly, this thing grabs and pulls and just wants to do its own thing. So I, I'm going to go ahead and cut the, the next slot again. And, and really, for the most part, we're going to do it um, just about like we did the first one. I'm going to lay this back in there and cut it that depth again. I think that's a good depth. Matter of fact, let me... Rather than guess, let's just get some exacts. Um, not that it really matters, because it doesn't matter too much. I'm looking for my uh, caliper. I don't see my caliper. Where did it go? It's there it goes. Here. That's why I call them calipers. I'm going to just check the, the depth here. We're at about 117 thousandths, which is about what I would have guessed. That's probably about what this is. This is 100 and Actually, this is a little more. This is 126 thousandths. Okay, we're at 100 and, it's 115 roughly. So I'm going to check the full depth of this now. And we're at 323. So if we cut another 100 and so thousandths out of there, we're still going to have 100 thousandths below it. So I think that's a good idea. I think we're going to go ahead and cut it again. Um, I, I really do think it's better to have it fairly deep because that keeps your saddle from folding forwards or backwards and that type of thing. And I think the closer you get it to your soundboard, the better you are too in terms of sound transfer. I'm going to lay the saddle in here yet again. I'm going to loosen this knob, set the uh, knob to the thickness of that saddle again, which is just a little over 100 thousandths. And now I can take the saddle back out and I can plunge this base that additional depth. All right, here we go. We're going to try this again and hopefully we don't make any mistakes. I'm calling to you like a long lost friend, but I know who you are. Okeechobee, all the way up to Mickendorpe, across the home of the Seminole, the alligator and the gull. Well, that went just about perfect, so we'll call that good enough. And uh, we can take all this rig off of here now. You can see it's a really nice, deep slot there's still it's still full of a lot of junk right now actually that would have been some really good dust to save but I don't necessarily care about that because I can make more dust in a heartbeat around here that looks really good almost looks like I didn't do it it looks so good real tight but we're gonna make us an antler saddle to fit that we'll show you how that goes this is my redwood top with bird's eye maple back and sides. Before that one got ran over by a car, it was the loudest mandolin in the history of mandolins. Run over by a car? Was it, it got, your car? It, it got ran over by a car, no joke. It busted the top in seven places. Can you see where they're broken? You can see one, but, but that's that happened later. But can you see the other seven breaks? No, I can't see. I can see one here, maybe. Yeah, there were seven all the way down through there. <laughs> was it your car that ran over? Yes, my <laughs> wife uh, was doing me a favor. <laughs> it's still pretty loud, but it was really loud before. That's the three-quarter size mandolin. It's 
crazy, isn't it? It is crazy. It's uh, the only thing, <laughs> it has a full size peg head, but otherwise everything else is three quarter. Wow, that is nuts. Goodness me. <laughs> it's amazing to me the sound it has too for a three quarter.